Hello. Okay, we are live now. All right, Gillis, we're live whenever you're ready. Lovely. Welcome, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Um, my name is Gillis. Uh, I'm going to be working with you today. I'm on front Scarborough Outdoor Education School, which is about three hours north of Toronto if you got in your car and drove all the way up here. We're in the middle of the forest, which is pretty amazing. If you pan over Dallas, you can see all of the forests that we're surrounded by. Um, so again, my name's Gillis. Behind the camera there is Dallas. Dallas will give you a wave. Hello, friends. And we're also working with Rich today, who's in another spot at SOES, or Scarborough Outdoor Education School. Hello, new young survivors. Awesome. We're really excited that you're online with us today. We're going to be showing you some cool shelters, survival shelters that we were able to build in this winter wonderland up north. So we're going to be talking about Quincy's, how to build them, different survival shelters that Rich might talk to you about in a minute. And we're also going to be making connections to your curriculum along the way. So I really hope you enjoy it. We're happy that you're here. Um, and before I send it over to Rich, it's really important that we do the First Nations land acknowledgement. So I'd like to say that we're hosted on the lands of the Anishinaabe, the, Miss, uh, the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And we'd also like to recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. Lovely. So we're going to send it over to Rich, and he's going to show you what he's got going on down there. Thank you. Thanks, guys. And I'm in a forest as well. And I just wanted to give a little bit of a shout out to the uh, north of me, uh, Nipissing First Nation by North Bay. It's an Anishinaabe nation. Uh, to the east of us is Pikwaknanagan First Nation on the east side of Algonquin Park. And directly between you and I uh, is Wata Mohawk Territory in beautiful Bala, Ontario. Uh, up until recently, if you wanted to learn Mohawk, you can uh, do online courses with uh, with Wata. So if you contact the band office, hopefully that's still going. Now, uh, guys, I'm in a forest as well. So we're in a really neat spot. I know that Dallas said that we're, or that uh, Gillis said that we're north of you, but he didn't say quite how far north of us we are, how far of you, how far north we are of you. And that's about three hours up Highway 11. So uh, usually we can say we have more snow than you do, but I think this time we have less snow but we sure have the cold. So when we look around, it's sunny and beautiful out right now. But as soon as it gets dark, and even right now, uh, pretty dangerous if we weren't prepared properly. So for example, uh, the temperature was minus 24 degrees Celsius just a few moments ago. And with the wind blowing, they were talking about wind chills of up to minus 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's pretty darn cold. That'll freeze a glass of water in an hour. So you can see how it might be dangerous if you were out here and you weren't prepared. So that's why I wanted to call you Young Survivalist, because we're going to give you a couple of tips, uh, a couple of techniques, and then we're going to talk about why this stuff works. So before we start on the shelters, guys, let's talk about what we're wearing. Uh, Dallas, you have some beautiful blue pants on. What's that about? Well, these pants, some of you may know them as snow pants. Uh, that's because they keep you warm, no? But these are these are pretty good insulators. They have some. They have inside. They have a thick layer of padding, and on the outside they have this slick material. When you kind of kind of listen, you can hear that sound, and it's it's because this this material is quite waterproof, so that when I go in the snow or even if it happens to rain, it's gonna lick right off me. Being wet and cold sometimes don't mix. Nice. Now Dallas, uh, that looks like a nice jacket, nice pants. Would that help you if it was all undone and all over the place? Or do you need to kind of be sandwich bagged and sealed up? That is a good point. It is important. As you can see, I got my jacket zipped up. I got everything zipped up. But you can almost see like no skin showing. What I'm trying to do is because what happens is your body creates heat. And I want to keep that heat close to my body around it. So I'm, I'm closing up all the gaps where any bits of air could get into me. Uh, that way, the warm air stays close to me and I stay super warm. So we're using the insulation of our jackets and our sweaters. And right now I have like three layers up top and two layers underneath. But Dallas, you're gonna show us that extra super layer that will keep us warm 
no matter what. If by Quit that you, you tab. <laughs> if by that you mean something outside of my clothing, do you mean something like that? No, I mean like a Quincy. That's like the biggest blanket ever. That's what I thought you meant too. I was just making sure. Yeah. So uh, as you may have heard, uh, we are going to talk about Quincy's today. So right beside me, what looks like just a big pile of snow, we like to call a Quincy. And snow, I know when we, when we usually think of snow, we oftentimes think snow is cold. And it is. If I, if I grab the snow with my bare hand, it starts to melt and it is very cold on my hand. But if we pack that snow together, we can actually make it become quite, quite insulating. It, it, snow can actually be a really good insulator. And we did a little experiment and we would love for you friends at home to try this experiment. You don't need a Quincy for this experiment. All you need is a pile of snow. We happen to use our Quincy. But for this experiment, we want to leave a water bottle full of water outside of the snow. And we did it for this one. And if you can notice, this water bottle is hard. It is frozen outside. However, when we go inside to our Quincy, we have another bottle. Maybe I'll just bring it out. I'll just bring it out to you. Inside of our Quincy, this bottle has not frozen. It is quite liquid. Hmm. So as we're talking, we're gonna get a little bit more into the insulation value of snow. But, but while we're thinking, this Quincy, it's kind of like a big blanket. It kind of keeps us warm. And how it does that is it protects us from some outside environments for sure, like that wind I was talking about earlier that might creep through the little holes and such in my jacket. It does a really good job of keeping the wind in. As you can see, we built up a little bit of walls to kind of help it um, keep some of that wind out. And it really does act like a really good insulating layer. Um, maybe we wanna take a, take a little journey inside of the Quincy to kind of see what it's like. You can see the outside here. We have our opening, I'm gonna crawl in. And inside our Quincy, maybe a little obviously we have a little bit of a sleeping bag. And we actually have a small candle lit. And this little tiny candle is, is there to mimic uh, our body heat. So if we were inside of this Quincy and our body was giving off heat, it would actually stay trapped inside of the Quincy to help keep us warm. So we put in the, the tea candle, a little candle to try to simulate that. And that was really helping keep our bottle from freezing. So if you kind of look around our Quincy, I'll try to give you a full over the top view. So it's a little bit funny being all have all snow around you. And the other thing is when I'm talking in here, my friend Gillis, who's just outside, actually can probably not hear me because the insulation of the Quincy is so, so good that it's actually blocking out the sound from him hearing. Pretty cool. Now, Dallas, is it the snow or the air that keeps it as insulation? Ah, uh, I was just about to get there. That, that is an awesome question. So this, the snow itself isn't actually what keeps you warm. It, it's that, that layer of air. And I, I kind of mentioned it um, when we were talking about our clothing, how we're trying to cap capture that layer of air. We need dead air space. It's kind of funny. When I think about it, I think of like almost like bubble wrap, how it's got the air bubbles in it. Kind of makes me think about it. It's not exactly the same, but similar. Um, to try to, try to keep that, that insulation there and having those, those, those air pockets, when everything gets squished together, not as good. So we want that little bit of air, a little bit of air space to help keep that warm air. Awesome. So it's one of these things, as long as we can trap that dead airspace in a survival situation, that's one of the big things to retain our heat is much smarter than losing it and trying to generate it, even though we can. So even if I had a t-shirt, if I grabbed some newspapers and crumpled them up on a bad day or something, that might insulate me if I needed it in a an emergency, uh, anything that's sort of keeping the wind away so we don't lose our heat. If we can stay dry so we don't have all of that heat go that way and then the dead airspace so it just doesn't leave. And then we can end up pretty comfortable. Now, Dallas, we spent a little while on that, Quincy. We should talk about, uh, you know, how thick the walls are, what the work is involved, because it's not just a 20-minute project, is it? Yeah, and, and maybe as I talk, if uh, my, my trusty camera man Gillis can follow me this way because I kind of did a little example of how I would start it. So come on and follow me. But first, let me tell you, as we walk over, 
that building a Quincy is a very time consuming and labor intensive is what I like for it means. It takes a lot of work to do. So when we're considering building a Quincy, we have to put that into consideration. Think about how much time do we have and how much energy are we using? So a little bit further. He's so fast. So we have baby gillis to chew on the ground. What I did to start off, before we even started the Quincy, we made a little bit of a circle to kind of mark out where we thought our Quincy would go. And I actually laid down inside of the middle to put out a body print to make sure that I was able to fit inside of the Quincy. And then the fun part happened where we spent, I spent, I would say at least two hours shoveling and shoveling and shoveling a big, big mound of snow. The, the size of it would depend how many people you might be staying in it, how to use the, the shelter for. But we would go around and we would dig and we would dig and we would dig for a long time, creating this big, 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 big pile of snow. And as soon as I built it, I was so excited. All I wanted to do was jump inside and start digging it out and digging it out, but I couldn't. And I'll tell you why. It is because when I put that big snow into a pile, when I lift up this snow like this and I throw it in the air, watch this, see how it kind of splits up into lots of, lots of little pieces. It's not really like that packing snow, that, that kind of more wet snow that, that would pack together really well. It kind of just crumbles. So what I did is after I left it in a big pile, a big pile, I left it there overnight to sit and stay. And we call that letting it center. And what's happened, it's a little bit of that airspace, like we talked about before, that was in between all the snow. It's slowly and slowly overnight, that force of gravity is helping us to push, push, push down on the snow to make it a little bit harder. So the next day I came out and really excited and I got my little shovel and I dug, 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 dug inside, inside. But I, for before that, what I did was I wanted to make sure because when I was digging through, it's kind of hard to tell exactly when I'm going to break through and come out of my Quincy and a Quincy with a big hole in the, in the middle of it isn't really capturing that air. It's not doing exactly what we need to do. So maybe if we could do a long range view, and maybe you noticed before on our other Quincy, um, I had a whole bunch of sticks sticking out of the Quincy. And it looks kind of funny. Maybe it looks a little bit dangerous, but we're not climbing on these Quincy's. Um, so if you look here, you can see all of these sticks coming out. So I went into the forest, and I made sure I found sticks that were already dead on the ground that I wasn't ripping off the trees. And I made sure they were all about the length of my arm. And once I knew that the length of my arm is about two feet long, I knew that if I stuck these sticks in halfway into the Quincy, they would be at least one foot into the Quincy. Therefore, when I started digging out my Quincy, I was digging and I was digging it and I came to a stick. Sticks mean stop. So I had to stop digging there and start going other ways until I found another stick. And the more sticks you can put in, the better. I'm an experienced Quincy builder, so I didn't put as many as you could. You could put as many as you want. The, again, the more, the better, so you know exactly where your Quincy is. And the reason I want to do that is because I want my walls to be thick and strong. I want it to be a strong and stable structure. So I want my walls to be very thick and all the way around so that it's a nice, perfect uh, dome on the inside. And I'm having that nice, even walls all the way along the inside. Sound nice, pretty cool, man. That's cool. So when we think about a Quincy, when we think about what it does, uh, we need to know the purpose, right? So it's keeping us warm in the winter time. Uh, the other thing is, is the materials are available. Uh, Dallas was telling us about the quality of the materials. If it's a powdery snow, it's going to be a little more difficult to make a Quincy. It might take longer for it to center or pack down. If it's kind of wet snow, uh, you could probably make that pile and start digging right away. A good way to think about it, guys and girls and young adults, is that if you take that uh, pile of snow and try and make it into a snowball, if you get a snowball out of it, you've got quality Quincy snow. So that's a great thing to think about. Now, if you're in an emergency, you might not have the time to build a Quincy. Uh, it's, it's great for a shelter for a few people, but say, for example, I was walking down the street and I got lost and it was really cold, so I needed to find a spot. There's lots of things we can think about that will keep us warm and still keep us safe. So one of the big things is, is we need to think about the size. Uh, let's go back to that blanket example. If we're using the Quincy as a blanket, 
usually when we have a blanket, it's going to be close to our body because we're trying to trap that heat in that dead airspace. So we really want a shelter in the winter time that's as small as it can be so that we can stay inside it. The less space we have to heat up, the happier we're going to be in the long run. So I made a shelter that's a little bit different. Uh, this has got a bunch of different names and I think this is where we have to explain that there's lots of different names for lots of these different things, but they're all emergency shelters. So the shelter we're looking at could be called a bunch of things. It could be called a trench shelter. It could be called a scout shelter and my favorite, a coffin shelter. Uh, the reason they call it a coffin shelter is because if you get inside and stay warm, you won't be coughing. <laughs> that was pretty funny. So I'm just gonna turn my camera around. No problem this time, quality phone, Veronica. But check this out. Now mine, because I was by myself and let's face facts, Dallas, I'm just lazier than you. So that's really what happened. So. I wanted nature to do a lot of the work for me. So I found out which way the wind was blowing and I found this super awesome spruce tree. And if you notice, the branches go right to the ground. So I jumped all over it. Those branches that were going right to the ground became a wall for my pit shelter, okay? Or my scout shelter. Now, if you notice, it just looks like a pile of snow, doesn't it? I did something clever here, and we're gonna have to talk about some of the materials that I used. Because of how I built mine, I was using something other than just snow. If you look inside, you can see all sorts of green and brown and all sorts of stuff, and then white on the sides. But when you come outside, you can see that I've used that same insulation, that really, really soft snow to uh, keep me insulated and keep the wind out, but it doesn't need to be sintered. And I'll show you what I mean. Just look, it's just, it's just powdery snow. So it's got lots and lots of dead airspace, uh, lots and lots of insulation factor. Uh, but the way I built it, I don't have to worry about it being structurally sound or stable. That's what the wood's for. So I'm just gonna grab a branch so that we can see. Uh, thankfully, I just happen to have one right here. It's a pretty exciting branch, but what I wanted to show you is basically what we're looking at. So when we look at a tree uh, or any branch, we're going to find some heartwood. Uh, we're also going to find some uh, sapwood and we're going to find some bark. Because of the way a tree grows and the way that its cellular structure works, it's a fairly, fairly good building material. Even these branches are quite flexible and have lots of strength for the size. Now, if we look at the cellular structure of a tree, it's got something called a xylem and a phloem. And I want you to think of, well, let's think of this tree right here. So we need the water to go up. So the xylem brings the water up the tree and lots and lots of it. And then the phloem, which is another set of cells that's kind of inside the xylem, it will move all of the sap, the food, to the different branches. So we have two things going on, but because of those vascular tissues, uh, it starts to help a little bit with the integrity of the, uh, of the uh, wood or the building material. Now, one thing that will happen that I'll think we should mention, uh, trees draw water from the ground. Water freezes, and because of your age, I'm pretty sure you all know that when water freezes, it expands, okay? So what is happening is that when it expands, uh, it, it changes right because when it freezes it's a little bit larger and if we have a tree that's got sap in it and those cells have water in them and it expands something bad might happen it uh, it might actually explode the cells in the tree and if you look around in a forest one of the cool things is is that we can see examples of this everywhere uh, we look at trees and we think that they just sort of sit in the forest we have uh, these deciduous trees for example and they will have all of the sap in their root ball, but not quite all of it. So I'm just gonna show you an example of what can happen from the power of water. Do you guys see that little crack up the tree? It goes up about three meters. That crack wasn't made by lightning. It wasn't made by thunder. It was made by freezing water. What happens is trees like this will have a little bit of sap left in that uh, flow them 
vascular tissue. And when it freezes to temperatures like minus 25 and things, the insulation of the tree can't protect it enough and it freezes. And when it freezes, it expands. And when it expands, the tree cracks, which is kind of cool. Uh, you might have seen this before uh, after a cold night. Sometimes people have cans of soda pop or something and they've kind of exploded. Our water bottle won't be the same shape uh, that's frozen on the outside because the liquid inside froze and got larger. Now, this is something that happens specifically with water, H2O. It's got H, hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen, and that makes a triangle. And what happens is because when it freezes, those triangles don't sort of contract properly and they don't sit flat. And that's why we get that expansion. And it starts to expand, funny enough, at about two or three degrees Celsius. So right before it freezes, it starts to get larger. So it does a lot of things like crack trees, break rocks, and all sorts of things. Now, I just wanted to show them this just because it's fun. This has nothing to do with what we're doing, but it's cool. We're bar a balsam fir tree. That's balsam fir sap right there. Can you see it? Okay. This comes from the forest. It's actually flammable. Look at that. So when we look at a tree, this resin is on the outside of the bark on these, uh, on these coniferous trees, cone bearing trees, and it's actually uh, flammable. So if you've learned nothing else today, some trees have stuff in them that catches fire other than the wood. We couldn't see so that. So yeah, we think about those structures and we can see that they've got a lot of things going on. So they're going to be a little bit stronger than just snow. Uh, snow is kind of stuck together. Uh, it can kind of hold for a while, but it doesn't have a lot of integrity this way. So when we make that Quincy, the walls had to be certainly thick enough and then we had to have that dome shape. Now, Dallas and uh, Gillis, we showed them, oh, you couldn't hear that? Dallas and Gillis, can you show them the other Quincy and show how thin we could make a Quincy if it was made with something else? We most certainly can. So this might be a little bit different. And maybe if we take a look at it, maybe you can have a guess on, maybe you can show that one, and then maybe show the other one right afterward. And if you can, maybe you guys will give you one second to think about it. What do you notice that's different besides the fact that this one doesn't have sticks sticking up? It's a little bit different something to do with the outside and maybe if this gets a little closer you can actually see that we put water on the outside of this one to help it freeze creating a different material because snow and ice as we know have different physical properties they're they're different they act differently um when we do things to them right um like heat them up or cool them down so if you look inside maybe you get a little bit of a view inside Pretty cool how much thinner those walls we were able to make than the Quincy. When I talked about the Quincy, we had to have at least one foot of wall in it. If you can notice, I would I wouldn't give these walls more than what you like be more than five centimeters. So we were able with different materials to build different things. And again, going back to what Richard said about planning and preparing, if we had to put water on this over and over again, this probably wouldn't be your survival shelter per se, but it does have a lot of good characteristics. That ice is, is very, very hard and it creates a nice tough exterior shell on top of it to help keep some of that air in again. Yeah, so also, we, Rich, I was gonna say, when I look underneath in this dugout, I can actually see light coming through the actual, the, the dugout. So it means that the, the ice that's on top is actually translucent and it's letting light into the Quincy. But Rich, I, I also wanted to talk about another property of snow, if that's okay. Yeah. Come on over. So something that, something that I kind of noticed is that Dallas built these yesterday with Rich's help. And it's surprising, we're in this, it's so sunny out right now, it's really beautiful. And we all know that the sun provides a lot of heat energy, right? And yet both these Quincy's, even the thin one, 
haven't even started to melt. I know that it's really cold outside, but sometimes even when the temperature is cold, uh, things will start to warm up just because of the sun. Uh, does anybody have any ideas? Why do you think, so we have a lot of snow and ice on top of here. Why is this structure not warming up? What is it about the materials, the snow that causes it not to warm up from the sunlight, that solar radiation? I'm wondering, and Dallas, maybe you can come over here and you can show a picture of what I put in the snow down here. This is just something that Rich uses for stretching, but it's made out of black material. I put it out in the sunlight and if I lift it up gently, you can see that it's actually made an indent in the snow. It has to do with the color of the different materials. The Quincy's are built out of snow. They're very light, they're bright, they're white. They reflect the solar radiation coming down that has heat and light. It reflects a lot of that radiation. It goes back into the atmosphere. Whereas this darker material that I put out in the sunlight actually absorbs the heat from the sun and it's starting to melt the snow here. And that kind of got me thinking about how the properties of snow might actually impact an entire climate or an environment. It might help balance an environment. It might keep an environment really cool. Can anybody think of an environment that might be impacted because it has lots of snow and what that snow might do to the environment? I'll give you a, a second to think, keeping in mind that snow really reflects a lot of that solar radiation back into the atmosphere. Snow, light materials, have a very high albedo. An albedo is a surface's ability to absorb sunlight. So snow might have an albedo of 95. 95% of the solar radiation gets reflected back into the atmosphere. Whereas a dark material has a very low albedo and it absorbs a lot of solar radiation. So I'm thinking about the poles, the North Pole and the South Pole. They're covered in giant blocks of ice and snow called glaciers. And up north in Greenland, Gr Greenland is mostly covered in a glacier. The Arctic Circle has a lot of glaciers and Antarctica has massive glaciers that can be like three kilometers thick in some places. Like that's as thick as 60 in towers stacked on top of one another. Really massive pieces of ice and they're huge. And you know what I said about ice and snow reflecting sunlight? The poles actually do a lot to control the Earth's climate. Because as the sun hits the North Pole and it hits the South Pole and it hits Greenland with those big glaciers, a lot of that solar radiation is reflected back into space. Instead of being absorbed by things like trees and oceans and soil, all absorb solar radiation. And this actually helps keep the entire Earth's climate cool. As more and more ice melts, there's less of that light, that light material, the white material, and more of the sunlight will be absorbed by ocean and it contributes to climate change. So I was just thinking about how snow actually can control or impact different climates and environments throughout Canada and other places in the world. And there's another thing that's kind of interesting as we talk about the weather changing and we know it's been pretty dramatic. Uh, we in Canada, especially where we are in Ontario, we know what snow's like. And even though Toronto got 30 and 40 centimeters, which is a lot, at least most people knew that it had to be shoveled out of the way and it was hard to drive in. Uh, there, there's places that have never had snow before that are starting to get snow and it causes huge problems. And one of the examples we need to think about is how a society lives and what a society does in Canada. Winter's a big part of our life. Four, five, six months a year are going to be below zero. And because of that, uh, 
we're used to it. We know that snow is the part of our life. Everyone's going to have jackets, probably. A lot of people will have mittens or gloves. Winter clothing is part of, part of what's in our closet. But if you live someplace like Texas or someplace in a very warm climate, uh, something like a snowstorm could end up being an actual disaster. So it's something that uh, we need to be mindful of when we think about how other people deal with it. Uh, it's easy to say that, oh, yeah, snow is not a big deal but only if you have a snow shovel. Now guys, I just wanted to show another emergency shelter. And I think this one's a really good one to know about because when we look at emergency shelters, uh, safe is the number one thing. Uh, and quite often a Quincy is what you'd need. When we talk about an emergency shelter in the winter time, it's to keep us warm so that we can get someplace safe later. So if I said I could make an emergency shelter out of a bench at school, you might be kind of, uh, I don't know, not like believing me. You might be a little bit concerned that I'm telling a fib, but we don't need much. So I want you to think about this as the structure of my emergency shelter. You see a bench and what I see is a joy system, uh, a set of materials that are going to be very strong and protect the snow from collapsing on top of me. It is very much like my snow shelter in the forest over there. It's just the material might be a little bit thicker. The other thing I'm going to do is I need to get that insulation. I need the snow with the dead air space and I need to make sure that I have uh, the wind blocked out. Now, it seems like a big job for one person, but really it's not. Uh, I cleared the snow off here, but this is what the, the benches looked like before I got here. What I see here is half an emergency shelter, really. All I needed to do, guys, and I'm not kidding you, is I just moved the snow around a little bit. So I left the snow on top of the bench just so. That's great insulation for the roof. It's going to be nice and safe. I have a two two-by-sixes protecting me, so that'll hold that no problem. I've also blocked out the snow and wind from the front and the sides all the way around. So I have three directions completely closed off. And then I have kind of a nice safe place to lay down and sleep. Once I'm in there, I might take some of this snow, uh, maybe a shovel, my backpack, and block up the hole a little bit more and a little bit more. Now, this is a pretty important thing to think about when we think about shelters. We talked about not letting wind in. We want to stay warm. We don't want to let the heat out. But we need to breathe, and we don't want to wake up soaking wet. So one of the tricks we need to do is make sure that we have air holes. Uh, for something like the Quincy that Dallas made, uh, all those sticks when they come out, they're gonna be holes of about two centimeters in diameter. And if we have five, six, 10 of those, that's gonna be enough air that we'll be fine. It'll also let that moisture out from when we, uh, when we sleep. A lot of people will, will not sweat too much when they sleep. Some will sweat a lot, but all of us are going to lose some moisture during the night. And I don't know the exact number, but I think it's around 500 milliliters minimum. So half a liter of water is going up into the air. And when it leaves our body as a vapor, it's gonna condense and it's gonna come down on us like rain, except the rain's gonna be our sweat. So it's kind of a weird sensation. But what it will do is if we have too much moisture, it's gonna mean that we're gonna wake up cold because as soon as our clothes are wet, we've affected the, the dead air insulation in them. So we need to be careful of that as well. So ideally when we make an emergency shelter, I hate to tell you this, but they're not supposed to be comfortable. They're kind of supposed to be a little bit cool so you don't sweat too much. Because if you sweat, you're gonna get cold. If you're gonna get cold, it's not gonna be much fun. Speaking of sweat, Dallas, what are you doing? <laughs> so I was thinking that, you know, I'm, I was feeling a little chilly, so I thought maybe it'd be a good time to get moving and maybe our friends at home, we could do like, kind of like a body break and, and get moving a little bit. How do, how do our friends at home think of that? What do we think of that? Think of that. Sounds great. Okay, I thought, what, what a better thing to do than let's just go from the beginning and we'll kind of pretend to make our own Quincy, okay? So let's get started. What do we gotta do? Well, first we gotta, we gotta get dressed, all right? So I want everybody to get on those boots. Get, oh, and the snow pants first, actually. Take off the boots. You gotta put your snow pants first. I always do that. And then the boots, and then the boots. Okay, now put on my jacket, my sweater, my gloves, put on your gloves. Put on your hat, okay. Now I'm ready to go. What do I need? I gotta get my materials, so I gotta go. Gotta open up the cover, get the shovel. I got another shovel over here. Gotta get that shovel out. All right, now we gotta walk out through the snow. 
It's deep snow, so everybody get those legs up. Get those legs up nice and hard. The snow's really deep down here. And it's okay, all right. We're at our spot. We gotta dig out our circle. So make a small circle on the ground. Make your outline, make your outline. All right. Now we're gonna lie down, make sure we can lay in it. Maybe make a snow angel while you're there, only if you have room in your house or wherever you may be in your classroom, wherever you are. Okay, now we got it, all right. Looks like we got our perfect Quincy space. We gotta start shoveling. All right, let's go everybody. Go shovel, shovel in there. A little more in the middle, a little more in the middle, a little higher. It's getting really big, it's getting really big, all right. Whew. But we gotta let it center, let's take a nap. Let's take a nap, all right, all right. Take a nap, okay. Wake up from our nap, our Quincy's ready. All right, now we gotta go, we gotta dig. Everybody help me dig. Dig, everybody start digging. Dig, 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 dig all the way in there. Oh, we're getting really deep. Go, dig, dig, dig. Inside the Quincy, inside the Quincy. All right, shovel all that snow out, kick it out with your feet. Shovel all that snow out, get it out of the Quincy. Get it out of the Quincy. Now it's blocking my way, I gotta shovel some more. I gotta shovel some more, now it's blocking my way. Okay, now my Quincy's there, we gotta go get our stuff to sleep in. Go back inside, get my sleeping bag, get my pillow. Come back in. Oh no, I forgot the candle. <laughs> Come back and put it in. Everything's in there. Woo! Quincy's done. We're ready to sleep in it. Thank you for the help. Awesome job, Dallas. Thank you. I hope that you guys are nice and warm. You had a chance to move around a little bit, practice building your own Quincy. That's really wonderful. I, before we move on, well, I wanted to talk about conserving energy and, and how the Quincy really Dallas kind of talked about how it insulates heat, things like that. And I want to say, how does it help us conserve energy? And I was thinking, when we eat food, right, there's stored energy in that food, and there's a chemical reaction that happens when we digest food that gives us energy. And we can use that energy. Some of us use a lot of it to think. Our brain uses a lot of energy. Dallas was using his energy to move around and stay warm. And our body also uses energy to keep itself warm. Now, Dallas and I and Rich are out in this minus 20 degree weather. It's really cold. You guys might be inside, which is wonderful. So when you do that exercise, your body really heats up, but you're in a warm space and your body's able to keep that heat. Us, on the other hand, we're outside in this cold weather. So Dallas is running around, his body warms up. He has all of his clothes on, which keep a little bit, a lot of heat in. It insulates the heat, keeps the heat in. But we also lose a lot of heat. Our faces are exposed to the cold, right? There might be some heat escaping from my jacket, things like that. So we can warm up, we can use that energy to warm up but we're gonna cool down pretty quickly. The wind's gonna come and it's gonna blow any heat that we've created away from our body. And it's gonna start making us feel cold again. Now, our body, like I said, it creates heat and it releases that heat away from our body. So Dallas, if you come on over here. When our body releases that heat in the wind, the wind just blows it away and it's replaced by more cold air. When I'm inside the Quincy, all of the heat that comes off of my body stays in the Quincy. There aren't holes on the top for the heat to escape. There's this big hole. I think if we were building this for ourselves, it might be a tiny bit smaller. Is that correct, Dallas? Definitely. So some of the heat might escape through here right now, but usually the hole's smaller. So all of the heat that our body creates stays inside the Quincy. So the temperature inside the Quincy is significantly warmer than the temperature outside. Dallas already kind of mentioned this. We're not exposed to the elements inside the Quincy as much as we are outside the Quincy. So I was just thinking about how our body turns the energy from food into heat energy which is released from our body and stored and kind of, it's not replaced inside the Quincy. Neat. So what we have to think about is when we talk about conservation of energy in a survival situation, we don't have much energy left. So I just want to talk about the animals that would be around here right now. Uh, this is a pretty interesting time of year. 
Uh, we're at the coldest part of winter, and there's been some interesting stuff going on this winter especially. Uh, we've had weather like today where it's minus 25 degrees, but yesterday it was zero degrees. And with those ups and downs, it's kind of hard for nature to figure out what it's doing. Uh, so we, we have some issues with some of the animals they are just not adapting well. And some animals are going to do great. For example, in weather like this, uh, lots of mammals will do fine that are here. Uh, things like the deer and pine martens and things like that, because their fur is just going to get thicker. Uh, as long as their fur is thick, they're going to have that dead airspace and insulation. So they're going to be fine. And if it gets too warm, they might have to get rid of some heat. But that it's easier to get rid of heat than it is to try and make heat. And that's one of the biggest things we need to think about. So when we think about uh, animals, they definitely need to conserve that heat. So lots of fur, if they have a dark color or their, or their furs changed a little bit, they'll absorb more radiant heat so they can stay warmer. Uh, the food is the big thing though. In the winter time, when you look around, we have some coniferous trees for the herbivores to nibble on, but we have a lot of snow. So anything that uh, lives above the snow would have to dig underneath to get their food. Uh, the other thing is, is that uh, because it's so cold, because of the weather, they might not have as much food just because of the way the weather's been working. So the same things that we go through in emergency situation are the same things that animals go through all the time. So it, it's really a neat way to sort of, uh, I don't know, gain a little bit of understanding about what uh, wild creatures have to do to survive. Now, Rich. guys, you've got a couple of shovels there. We've built a Quincy. We've talked a little bit about the safety. We know the walls need to be uh, about 30 to 40 centimeters thick, about the thickness of your arm. We know that it's going to insulate us. What are some of the things we need to think about if we're building one of these? How can we do it safely? Thanks. Thanks, Rich. Um, well, when you're building structures, anytime, it might be in your backyard, it might be when you're older and you work for a company, uh, it might be outside in the snow. There are four main factors that you need to think of. Okay, personal factors, social factors, economic factors, and environmental factors, okay? I'm thinking, if we're thinking just about the Quincy, I'm wondering if we can go over those four factors and think about the types of things that we would need to consider when we're building the Quincy. So what are the personal factors that everyone might have in order to build the Quincy? What are the things you need to think about personally when you're building a Quincy? There are a couple of things that stand out to me. Like, how cold am I? Am I, or, or I should say, when you're building any survival structure, you need to think of those four factors, okay? So if I'm building a survival structure, how cold am I in the moment? And how much time do I really have before the sun goes down to actually build a safe shelter for myself? Depending on those factors, like if I'm really, really cold and I don't have a lot of time, I will not be able to build a Quincy. Because like Dallas said, what was the word that you used when you have to let it sit for a minute? Sinter. Sinter. You have to let it sinter for a while, okay? I might not have that much time in a survival situation. So I might need to build one of the shelters that Rich had demonstrated in our other location because it is a little bit quicker. So the personal fact. The second one are the social factors, okay? Things like, are there other people with me that can help contribute to building this structure, okay? So if, if I want to build a Quincy, I could do it by myself. It would take a long time. But if I had a group of people, we might be able to do it in a shorter amount of time. And then it's a real, it's a possibility as a survival shelter, okay? The third factor are economic considerations. So what does that mean, economic considerations? It's really, is there funding? How much, how much does the equipment cost to build the different shelters? Now we're lucky, we're up north, we're building the Quincy's. It's fairly, there's zero cost to building a Quincy. We're using the snow, we're using sticks that we found in the forest. If you're building other survival structures, 
or any structure in general, you need to think about how much does it cost to buy all of the materials? Okay? And that's something you need to consider when you're building any kind of structure. The fourth is the environmental factors. So what is available to you and what are the conditions outside? So that's something we needed to think when we were building the Quincy are, are the snow conditions right? If the snow is really, really, really cold, it's too powdery, it doesn't pack well enough, and it's really hard to build a Quincy. Okay, if it's too slushy, it might be difficult as well, right? Are there trees available? Like in our area, there are lots of trees that Dallas could use to stick in the Quincy to help him build it, right? If you go further north, then they won't have the availability of the trees. So their survival, their survival structures would have to rely solely on the snow. And that's why igloos that are built further north are made from ice, right? They don't have, yeah, they're made from ice, okay? So those are really four things. You need to also think with the environment, again, how cold is it going to be? What does this shelter need to protect me from? Is there wind, is there snow? I need to think about all of these factors while I'm building shelters. Rich, are there any other um, things that you think we need to think about as we're building these shelters? Yeah, for one thing I just want to talk about uh, building shelters, if you decide to do this, it's a great fun activity. We love people to be safe. So the first thing I want to tell you is where to never, ever build a shelter. And everyone's going to say, darn it, that's where I was going to build my shelter. That is a snowbank. A truck has made this snowbank. They use it to clear off a driveway. Okay, there's one over there, and I'm sure every student and every teacher that's seeing these things are going, wow, there's 100 ready-made mediums to make Quincy's, except there's one problem. There's going to be a truck by again to clear the snow, and he's going to put the snow in the same spot he did, right where you put your Quincy. Uh, it's a very unfortunate thing, but a lot of people... Uh, make these mistakes at ski resorts and things like that. They'll build a snow cave in a parking lot and they don't make it up. So absolutely never, 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 absolutely not. If you're going to build a Quincy, not in a parking lot, do it in a park. Number one. The other thing is, is have some friends with you. Uh, Quincy's are snow. Uh, we don't breathe snow. So if something went wrong, you'd want to be getting out of there pretty quickly. Uh, so we need to follow those rules. We need to make sure that the pile's right. We need to make sure that it centers properly. We need to make sure that it's thick enough using those sticks that, uh, that Dallas was talking about. And really, if you want to make your uh, Quincy look like a porcupine, you make it look like a porcupine. I mean, go Chia Pet. The more sticks, the better. So you can uh, really get some nice style and design in your Quincy that way but more important to us is that you'll know how thick those walls are and how safe it is. The last thing is, and I really, really think it's super important, take a course. Uh, there are so many ways that we can, darn it, there are so many ways that we are able to learn this stuff. Uh, uh, the Scarborough Outdoor Education School actually has, uh, when we get you back up here, we can teach you how to make the Quincy's. Uh, we do camping. And there's courses you can take through various, various organizations. And just a little aside uh, to everyone, the Red Cross stopped doing swimming lessons this year. Just an aside. So when we think about the things to be safe, we need to make sure that we have the right education or at least the right skills and the right guidance. Uh, I'm a big fan of using my spidey sense. And if I'm doing something and it doesn't feel safe, chances are it's not and i hope you guys think that way too is that safe are we going to have fun and is it going to cause any problems yeah rich maybe i can add a little bit more to the safety too because you know i just like to think about when i'm building a quincy or, or any shelter for that matter is having something over over top of my head oftentimes can make me feel a little bit nervous and nervousness sometimes is a good thing it's your body kind of telling you hey is this safe should i be doing this so maybe it's it's a good time for you to think again of is this a safe thing to do so me having all my experience and being taught by by many many other people and, and taking courses and, and doing school like Richard said I have the knowledge to build it and I feel very confident right but you don't have to necessarily 
build a snow shelter that has a roof. You can totally make that mound of snow and just start digging through it and just have nice big vertical walls. Those vertical walls are much less likely to cave on you than not. However, I wanted to show you guys, just because I, I really do trust in the Quincy, uh, it's a very nice dome shape, which is good. And I'm actually, I'm gonna do this. I'm just trying to on top of the Quincy. So it's just in to show you that it is quite a stable structure. Even with a 200 pound van on it, um, it, it, it can really support a human being. Never, ever, ever go on top of a Quincy if someone was inside of it. That's a really, really big no-no. Um, and again, Richard said, said it before. I'm going to reiterate it. Always be with people. Um, when I was shoveling the snow, I was a little bit alone. But as soon as I went to dig that out, I made sure I had Richard there with me. If for some reason the snow were to fall on you, um, there is, we talked about it before. This is a perfect uh, segue, that there is air within those snow, uh, within the snow. And when it falls on you, you won't suffocate. You won't die. And if you have friends there, they will be able to get you out. So that's obviously if you do everything right, that will never, ever happen. Uh, but it's always good to think ahead and think of those safety things. The, the what if questions. The, what if this happened? Would I pre be prepared? What if that happened? What would I do? Always think about these questions before you're doing anything. And whenever something's over top of your head, especially something like snow, that's form can change so e easily with things like heat. Uh, we're gonna be really aware if we're building something over top of us that we're being really, really safe. I would hate for something to happen. And again, like Richard said, the best way to do it is just be educated, right? This is just yeah. a short, brief lesson on the snow shelters. We could talk about this all day. Unfortunately, we don't have the time. But if you're really interested, do a little more research and go have fun for sure. Richard, is there anything else you want to add to that? I just wanted to say, let's remember all the opportunities for materials that we have. So we could build the walls of a Quincy and then put pieces of wood across so that we knew that the top wouldn't collapse on us. Uh, because when a Quincy collapse, and I'm hoping we can get Dallas to do this, do a collapse of a very thin walled Quincy, just because I need to see it on TV. Do it, man. Do it. You have to talk while you're doing right, it. We're going we're to walk on over to the second Quincy, the thin walled Quincy, the translucent Quincy, and we're going to watch Dallas maybe break through it, depending on how stable it is. There's Dallas. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that didn't work very well. Not, not quite as. Oh. Okay. So, you, so Dallas, you, show them how thick the walls are in that. Let's talk about why it worked, though, before we leave. Go right here. Oh. Are you breaking? Yeah, you can, you can see it's significantly thinner than the Quincy, uh, the other Quincy that has the sticks in it. And that really contributes to the strength of the Quincy. Right now, now, when we look at that, it's not made of snow. It was made of ice. So let's think about how it's made. Uh, we've got our snow that's centered. It's snowflakes that have collapsed but have dead airspace in them. But it's still hundreds of thousands of snowflakes stuck together. That ice is basically a homogeneous solution. It's, it's all water. It's all H2O. And when it's become solid, it's become a, a pretty pretty strong form in itself, a, a solid structure really, that we made into a dome. But to give you an idea, if we're talking about winter safety, if we ever go on a lake or if we're going on ice, number one, there is no safe ice. You have to test it. You need to know what you're doing if you're going out there. But I will tell you what the provincial police say are safe ice thicknesses to go on lakes. So at 10 centimeters, I could go walking. At 20 centimeters, I could take my snowmobile. At 30 centimeters, I could take a transport truck. So when we look at the strength of ice, it is hugely strong. And it's a good thing to think about because a lot of our country needs the strength of that ice to drive on to get materials and goods and food to remote communities. The only time that they can use vehicles like trucks is during the winter time kind of seems backwards after the last couple of days, doesn't it? Uh, Rich, I, Rich, I just saw this structure that Dallas built over here and I thought it'd be fun to kind of show. 
but Dallas is even out of the snow, make, made a little chair for himself, a throne, so that, or maybe this is you, Rich, but that's No, no, I'm... that wouldn't be me, man. I would be uh, always standing. But that's a really fantastic thing to think about. You guys are going to go outside after this. You are inspired to create structures in the snow and maybe use different mediums like water to freeze them. There's no wrong way to do this when you're creating something. There's only ways that you can be safe and unsafe. So let's make sure that you think about you first and the stuff you're going to create second. But boy, can you do neat things with snow and ice, especially now. We lost Dallas. Here, give me a second. Can you hear oh. me? Yep. Okay, lovely. Sorry. Yeah, ju just so, yeah, when we think about that, that stuff's fantastic. What we can do. Dallas, when we're finished, what are we going to make? Ooh, I would I think we should make the world's biggest snow person. Nice. I think we should do something like a St. Louis ice arch. Oh. That like when the uh, we just kind of get an arch made fully out of ice, how would we do that? I don't know yet, but that's the neat thing. Students, there is no wrong way to do this stuff. Create, prototype. If it breaks, that's okay. There's nothing more fun than breaking a Quincy that didn't quite work out, and then you can try again. Uh, when we try things that we haven't done before, they don't go great every time. But after we do it a few times, it's amazing how lucky you can get. Awesome. So, Veronica? I don't know what time it is. Rich, it's about 2.56. Oh, cool. We did pretty well then. So let's just recap the safety things so that they are recapped last. Number one, you can build the snow pile by yourself all you want. Number two, it has to center overnight before you try to dig inside it. Number three, you will need to have pieces of wood or poles that you can stick in anywhere from 30 to 40 to even 50 centimeters deep, you can have the walls as thick as you want. Then when you go in and start digging it out, you need to make sure that you have people around you to help you and watch you. And then finally, you need to make sure you have air holes. If you do all those things right, your Quincy will be okay. And remember what Dallas said, if you're not comfortable, Put some supports up or keep that outside stuff free so that your head's never going to be underneath and just make massive snow forts. Awesome. So, guys, I, I wanted to say thank you. Uh, it's been really cold out here, but thankfully we've had lots of sun. We've got lots of insulation on. So we haven't had any problems with frostbite or anything. So I'm going to just do that as the last little thing that I'm going to say, guys. Just think about frostbite. Uh, what we like to do is we have frostbite buddies. So you go with a friend and you make sure that you're not going to experience frostbite. And today you could. So if you see like a, if you have light colored skin, you might see a white patch with a red circle around it. Might start on the tip of your nose, might start on the tip of your ears. If you have a darker complexion, it's going to be shiny. But no matter what the complexion is, it's going to be a little bit hard where you touch it. Remember what we talked about with those cells before and the water bottle and the water freezing in the cells? That's frostbite. You have liquid in your cells and we're not keeping it warm enough to keep it liquid. It turns into a solid. So we don't want that to happen, do we? That was my last final warning. Go out and have fun, guys. Yeah, totally. I just wanted to remind them just of this last experiment because I think it's so cool. Two bottles of water, you know, one goes right into a nice structure that's all you got to do and the other one right out of the ground right out exposed to it as easy as that come back in two hours three hours check on it every once in a while i think it's really cool it really shows quincy sort of effect on a small scale term where we don't gotta shovel like i did for two hours but thank you so much for joining us we've had an amazing time learning and we hope you tune in to many more broadcasting experiences awesome Thanks, everybody. I had a blast today. I hope you guys learned something and enjoyed our, our video. Wonderful. Nice. And guys, tomorrow, 2 o'clock, campfire. It's a can't miss. You, you, can't, you can't miss a good campfire. Then you'll see us move.